Okay, so in this last lecture video for chapter 9, um, at this point we would have had an introduction to statics and torque video. We would have had a lecture video on the conditions for equilibrium. Uh, and then we would have seen eight separate examples of statics problems and how they are solved and the different things that can make them difficult or easier, um, but always, always we had the same process. What we have left in the chapter for this final lecture video um, is mostly concept-based. We've already covered the single big problem type out of chapter 9, which is a statics problem, um, and there's lots of examples to look at in the videos. There's lots of examples to look like in the extra practice set. What we have left is to kind of hit home a couple of key ideas and also introduce a couple of concepts that are related to this idea of rotation and statics and torque. So that's going to include stability, um, which is section 9.3 in the book. It's going to include simple machines, uh, which is section 9.5, and it's going to include forces and torques in muscles and joints, which is section 9.6. So let's start out with stability. Sometimes when we have objects that aren't moving, they can be pushed a little bit and they're still stable, or they can be pushed a little bit and then they fall right over. This tells us whether they are in a stable equilibrium. So for example, the pencil that we have at left, um, which is this super short like golf pencil kind of thing, we want to think about whether that pencil is in a static equilibrium. So that first question is asking, is it stationary and not rotating? The answer here is yes. And then the second question is, is that pencil in a stable static equilibrium? And that question takes a little bit more thinking. In order to figure out if it's a stable equilibrium, we have to think what happens if we push on it. Now, it is in a stable equilibrium up to a certain amount of push. So let's imagine the left example here. If we push on the pencil a little bit and we look at where the center of gravity is compared to what the point is now that it's rotating around, if we push on it a little bit, then it will um, go a little bit up, but then it will kind of rock back and, and go back to being stationary. It's the same kind of situation that if I had, um, let's get a book, and the glass. If I have this glass and I push on it a little bit, it bounces a little bit and it goes back to where it was. If I push on it too much though, I'm not going to because I don't want to break anything, if I let go it will continue to fall. And so on the right side of our um, slide here, we have what happens if you push on the pencil a little bit too much. Now if we look at where the center of gravity is compared to that axis of rotation, the pivot point, We've now pushed so much that the center of gravity has shifted over and our push is causing um, counterclockwise rotation and the um, force of gravity is also ca causing counterclockwise rotation. That becomes unstable. So this first example of a pencil is stable until we push too much. The big difference here is this new example where we're balancing on this little tiny point already and at the moment the center of gravity is lined up with the pivot point. If we're able to get it to be stationary then it is in a static equilibrium but is it in a stable equilibrium? What will happen if we like breathe a little bit too closely to this nicely balanced pencil? If we think about it any amount of push even if we just like blow on it a little bit, it's going to fall right over. So it is not in a stable equilibrium. One of the ways that we can um, think about this difference between stable and unstable equilibrium is about the center of gravity and what happens when we um, push on it, when we displace an object from equilibrium. If Gravity is trying to oppose our displacement. We cause clockwise rotation, but gravity is causing counterclockwise rotation. That's going to be stable. Effectively, what we're doing is if we tip that object, the center of gravity goes up a little bit, like up vertically compared to where it was. 
Whereas an unstable equilibrium is where whatever we try to push, whatever clockwise or counterclockwise rotation we start to cause, gravity adds to that same clockwise or counterclockwise rotation and kind of helps us out knocking the thing over. Tipping that object would lower its center of gravity. If we compare a tricycle to a bicycle, for example, the reason that tricycles are so um, stable is if you, um, if you get a little bit knocked sideways, the, um, the wheel that is still on the ground becomes the pivot point, and the whole thing has gone up a little bit, so gravity's trying to set it back down onto the ground. That top idea is a stable equilibrium because tipping it raises the center of gravity. Whereas a bicycle is very similar to our second pencil on its end kind of situation. As soon as we knock that bike over a little bit, if it were somehow able to stay upright, as soon as we knock it over a little bit, it falls right down. And so that's the big difference between stable and unstable. Now, in class, we have a bunch of... Um, real examples that we can look at, demonstrations that we just can't reproduce here. And so we won't go into further details um, of stability. But it is something where there's lots of, um, if you look up, um, you just Google stable static equilibrium, you'll be able to find some of these demonstrations. And if we get a chance to, we might link to them um, in, the, in the Blackboard site, but we might not have a chance to. And so um, I don't want to promise that. But in all of the cases that um, we'll see, the two pictured here as well as anything else that you might be able to find, the key thing is that for a stable object, there's a huge amount of mass that is low down. So on the left side of our uh, screen with the little um, tightrope walker toy, the masses, M2 and M3, are really, really low down, and so the center of mass is, is actually kind of low. It's below where that um, toy's feet are supposed to be. In the right example, which, you know, if you've got time and you've got a ruler, string, and a hammer at home, you can actually set this up on your own, and it is somewhat stable because the hammer is a huge amount of mass that is then below the table itself. And so if you tap on the end of the ruler, the whole thing kind of shakes back and forth, but it doesn't immediately fall off the um, table. Certainly if you hit it too hard, just like with the initial pencil example, it's only stable up to a certain point. Okay, so now we move on to simple machines. Our textbook has this whole separate section on simple machines, um, and we really are only gonna focus on uh, a small portion of that discussion and we're going to focus on levers. Now, I need to uh, introduce two terms that show up in the book and that show up in our slides, not because they are objectively super key ideas for us, but because we want to make sure we know what these terms are when they come up. So the reason that we use tools as human beings, the reason that we use tools is because they make our lives easier. The way that we can describe how much um, easier it is to use a tool instead of just trying to lift something with our own hands is mechanical advantage. That is a ratio between what amount of force we are applying to something like a lever and what amount of force that lever is able to then apply to the object that we're trying to lift. So for example, the picture shown here might have a really heavy rock that we would not be able to actually physically lift up but this um, lever that we've made, we can push down on that lever on the end and actually get the rock to lift up enough for someone to maybe bring a cart underneath it or a wheelbarrow. We will also see the term fulcrum. Fulcrum here is the point around which a lever or a seesaw kind of situation um, pivots. So in the picture here, it's that metal can um, that's been drawn in that this whole thing is pivoting around. So if we see those terms, we just want to recognize what they mean. In any kind of lever, functionally there are really three different forces at work for the simple levers that we're gonna be talking about. We are applying a force, we are pushing down on the lever, that's our input force, and that is allowing us to either lift or at least balance a weight of some kind, a block or the rock in the previous example, something 
that we are trying to then do um, with this lever. That's going to be our output force. There is also a normal force at the fulcrum, at that pivot point, and that normal force balances the combination, the addition of input down and output down. And so typically we're not really solving for the normal force. It doesn't help us understand the situation, but what we are doing is figuring out how these two different torques, the input force at a certain distance, balances with the output force at a certain distance. Now if we think about mechanical advantage, the previous slide had it in words, mechanical advantage MA, by definition it is the output force over the input force. We're trying to lift something that is heavier than the force that we're pushing down with. But if we think about the fact that these two torques have to balance, then functionally that mechanical advantage is also going to be the ratio of the much further away distance that we're pushing and the much closer distance that that load weight is, um, is attached to. So when we are seeing these simple lever examples, we are trying to build up this kind of understanding that the ratio of the distances is a similar ratio to the ratio of the forces, where big distance is associated with the small force and the small distance is associated with the big force. We can plug in numbers here, but it really is as simple as our starting problems, example 9A, example 9B, those kinds of situations. So these are not actively tougher statics problems, but they're getting us to try to be able to look at a situation and have a sense of what's going on. And we'll see some number values come up here um, in just a couple of slides where I don't want us to just um, immediately plug numbers into our calculator and try to do it that way. I want us to think about if we can build up this intuition based on our understanding of the underlying concepts. Now a nail puller is um, an example of a lever even if it doesn't immediately seem like it because we would never want to, uh, I don't know about you, but I would never want to actively try to pry a nail out of a board. That doesn't sound fun to me or my fingers. But we use this nail puller to push down far away from the nail. There's a point where the nail puller tool is actively touching the surface. That becomes the pivot point. And then we're able to get the um, nail up out of the board a little bit so that it becomes easier to then, um, to get, then get out otherwise. That's true for a separate um, nail puller tool. It's also true for the kind of back of that claw hammer um, that is the typical hammer that we think about. It is worth noting though that these tools are not magic. We don't get free work out of this. If we think back to chapter seven, our understanding of work, which is force in the direction of motion times distance, Although we're pushing with a small force, we have to have that nail puller go down a huge amount in order to get the nail to come out a little bit. To hit, hit, hit this home a little bit better, if we apply an effort of 20 pounds and we are moving this lever a full five feet through the air, then if we are trying to lift a rock that um, has a weight of 100 pounds, it will only lift up one foot, 20 times five, is equivalent to 100 times 1. So we don't get free work out of this, but what it does allow us to do is to get that rock up into the air enough that we can then get something under it and carry it away um, with other tools that we have. So something to keep in mind as we move forward. Okay, so some number examples that again, I want us to try to think through without immediately doing a full quantitative problem to see if this idea of simple levers is, is kind of clicking with us. So this first example, if the cat shown here has a weight of 20 newtons and the board is ready to tip over, so although it looks like there are two supports, this idea and this phrasing, we will see this again um, in homeworks or quizzes or whatnot, if the board is ready to tip over, then what would the weight of the board be? So look at the um, two distances. The cat is 45 centimeters away from the pivot point 
and the center of gravity of the board is only 15 centimeters away from that pivot point. I want you to think about um, that ratio and decide, pause the video if you need to think through it, and if you need to, pause the video and work through the math if, if it's going to help you understand this. But I want you to think about what the weight of the board would have to be using this kind of concept that it is a um, simple lever problem. Okay. All right. So if we look at these distances, 15 centimeters and 45 centimeters, the cat is three times farther away from that pivot point, and so the board has to be three times heavier. Remember that big distance has to be connected to the small force. 20 times 45 balances our unknown weight times 15. And again, you can do that math if you need to on the board. I'm not going to show it because I really am trying to get us to think about this conceptually. But the cat being three times farther away means the weight that's balancing is three times bigger. The weight of the board in this example would be 60, 60 newtons. And again, if you need to, you can set up the whole problem and double check that your result is also 60, 60 newtons. This diving board, although it doesn't really look like a lever, is actually the same structure as our simple lever examples. If we think about the way that this problem is set up, if we didn't have the diving board nailed down in the back, it would just flip forward and um, the diver would fall into the pool, but so would the whole diving board. So in order for that diving board to work when this person is jumping off of it, it has to be pushed down in the back as well so it can balance and then they can jump off. So think about the weight of the person, shown here as 700 newtons, and the two distances that we have here compared to that central support. And again, pause the video if you need to, but just looking at the numbers, we should be able to get the values of F1 and F2 from this without actually plugging numbers into our calculator, except if we want to double check things um, sort of small number math that we've done in our heads. So think through this one. Okay. So again, we have this nice ratio of distances. 1.5 meters compared to 3 meters. The diver is twice as far away from the, back, uh, from the central support as the back of the board is. So that bigger distance away and the smaller number force balances the bigger number force with the smaller distance. 700 newtons times 3 meters has to balance F1 times 1.5 meters. So that back support pushing down F1 is, a, is 1,400 newtons. And that central support would then have to be the combination. So I will draw this one out um, so that we can make sure we're thinking about this properly. So we have the um, central support here. This is three meters. This is 1.5 meters. So we have 700 Newtons here and our unknown F1 here. This is trying to cause clockwise rotation. This is trying to cause counterclockwise rotation around the axis. And so torques clockwise equal torques counterclockwise. We have 700 times 3 is equal to F1 times 1.5. We divide by 1.5, and we will get that F1 is equal to 1,400 newtons. Then to get F2, we just have to think about the fact that the forces also have to balance. And so if we look at the force diagram, we have F2 pointing up. We have the gravity of the person pointing down. We have F1 pointing down. And so if we look at F net equals zero, 
and that means that F2 minus 1400 minus 700 equals zero. And so F2 is 2100 newtons. And although it is fine to go through all of that math to double check, it is a much more powerful test of our understanding if we can look at that picture and look at the ratios when we have simple levers like this, which is not what most of our problems in this chapter look like. But when we have simple levers like this, we can use that to our advantage and get that kind of intuitive understanding that F1 has to be twice as big and then F2 is just um, adding up those two downward forces to balance. Okay, so, so far, all of the examples that we saw, um, both the regular seesaw, the nail puller, the person um, who's lifting a rock, even the cat on the um, um, board that was about to tip and the um, diver that we just saw, all of those examples have been first-class levers, where the pivot point is in the middle, kind of like a seesaw, and we push down on one side and the load itself is on the other. Now first class doesn't mean like awesome, best, top shelf, all that kind of thing. There are just three different classes of um, levers. So we aren't gonna worry about memorizing these. Um, please don't feel like you have to, but it's worth recognizing there's three different situations that we can have, two of which are useful machines and one of which we will talk about why it even exists um, in uh, our remaining slides. So first class lever is just like a standard seesaw. There's a central pivot point and everything goes around it. A second class lever, we are lifting up on the end of something and what we are trying to lift is um, between us and the pivot point. The most um, common example of that is a wheelbarrow. But before we get to that point, we can think about a mobile. Um, a mobile can be solved with lever ideas. So um, if you've ever had one of these at home or if you've ever seen one in pictures or whatnot, this is just a whole bunch of different objects that are all kind of balanced and sometimes they rotate. But we can use these different ideas of, um, of ratios of distances to our advantage. So I want you to think through this. Um, you can certainly work through this problem to test yourself, to test your understanding, to solve for M1, M2, and M3. That would at some point require a calculator. But all I want us to think about right now is if we add up the mass of the milk and cauliflower together, how does that compare to the mass of the steak example? And first of all, I have no idea why someone has bought a mobile for their kid um, that is all um, groceries. I would totally go with a solar system or something like that. But, you know, to each their own. Maybe they just really like groceries. So um, without doing the whole problem, I want you to think about how the total mass of the milk plus cauliflower compares to the mass of the steak. Pause the video if you need to, and please try to think through this without plugging anything into a calculator. But think through this question um, and then unpause the video when you're ready. Okay. So if we look at where that portion, and I'll try to use my cursor to see if maybe it'll show up on the slide. If we look at where that portion is actually attached to the relevant um, the relevant balanced bar the stake is 24 centimeters away from the rope which is our pivot point here while the milk plus cauliflower is only six centimeters away what that means is for the um, combination of those things we're asking about it is closer to the pivot point which means it has more mass. So our answer is um, option two, more mass. And we can actually say very um, with certainty that once we compare 24 centimeters with six, that's a ratio of four. And so it's actually four times more um, mass overall. So milk plus cauliflower together is gonna be 1.2 kilograms. And if we glance at the milk 
and the I keep saying cauliflower. It does actually look like broccoli, doesn't it? Whatever. Um, the milk and the broccoli are cauliflower. The milk has more mass because it is closer to that bottom balance point. Okay. So trying another one, um, and now we get to our second class lever example. I want you to look at this wheelbarrow, and if the load that we've put into it, maybe we've put a whole bunch of dirt that we're going to use for gardening or a whole bunch of rocks we're trying to get out of our um, backyard, that weight in the wheelbarrow is 10 centimeters away from the wheel that becomes our pivot point. It's the only thing touching the ground. And we're lifting up on the handle 80 centimeters away. I want you to think about what that means for how much weight um, or how much we have to lift in order to hold up 800 newtons worth of rocks or dirt or whatever we've put into our wheelbarrow. So as always, pause the video here. Try not to use a calculator if you um, can help it and think through what the answer has to be here. Okay. So common sense should tell us that the answer can't be number three here. If a wheelbarrow all of a sudden caused us to use a whole lot more force than simply lifting that stuff, there's no reason why anyone would buy a wheelbarrow. But the wheelbarrow allows us to lift a lot more than we would physically be capable of because we are lifting further away from the pivot point, and so we apply a smaller force. Since we are eight times farther away, we only have to use one eighth of the force. And so the answer here is option one, 100 newtons. You can go through and do this full statics problem if you need to, using the wheelbarrow um, wheel, the foot touching the ground as the axis of rotation. You will get 100 newtons. Now with the three different types of levers, I'm going to um, go back to that slide briefly. A third class lever is one where the effort that we apply is closer to the pivot point than the load. What that should tell us right away is because that effort is closer, the force we are applying actually has to be larger than what we are trying to lift. So you might think to yourself, why would anyone buy a third class lever? And you're right, we wouldn't use that as a tool or a simple machine. But if we think about a lot of different examples within the human body, we have to have our muscles physically close to the pivot points, the um, elbow joint um, in this particular example, because we have to have our bodies be physically contained, right? We can't have our muscles way out um, in the middle of nowhere. That would look really weird, um, and we wouldn't do that. But a typical situation like this, maybe we are holding up a... Um, either really heavy baseball or we just are holding up this huge block on top of it. Our muscles have to have a much, much larger force um, throughout because they are acting really, really close to the elbow. We don't have to plug in numbers here to be able to see that. That if we are thinking about our, um, our elbow as the rotation, if I try to hold something like this super heavy um, whiteboard eraser, if I try to hold something, I'm holding up the weight of my arm and whatever block I'm, um, I'm holding, and my muscles has to, have to be really, really close to be, able to, um, to be able to balance that. One thing that you can test even for yourself is if you just even holding nothing at all, you're holding up the weight of your arm, if you hold your arm like that for a while, your muscle already starts to get tired because it has a huge amount of force in it right now simply to balance the fact that your, the weight of your arm is further away from your elbow than your muscle is. So with lots of different situations that we can think of in the book, it will be worth flipping through either digitally or physically flipping through section 9.6 to see these different um, real-world examples of different muscles and joints 
um, and how those forces really compare um, that are running through our muscles and even our tendons as well. So for example, the Achilles tendon has much higher forces than just your own weight when you are trying to walk forward um, and pivoting around your uh, the ball of your foot or the um, ankle. There's lots of different situations we can set up there. And for people who wear high heels, that actually puts your um, Achilles tendon even closer to this pivot point than wearing flat shoes. And so people who wear high heels tend to have more toned um, legs, uh, leg muscles, because those muscles have to work harder overall to be able to walk forward. So something to, to keep in mind if you're uh, deciding on what shoes to buy next. Any human joint can be a statics problem, and we're not going to go through a whole bunch because in general, although it looks complicated, they tend to just be two torques balancing each other. And there's some book problems that you can try in the skill drill um, with solutions posted, and they aren't actively more difficult than the statics problems that we already have example videos for, and we're not going to add more to that. We just want to point out this connection that we can make with these different um, real-world circumstances. The one, um, the one joint muscle problem that I will highlight is your knees have a lot of um, muscles and um, ligaments and things really, really close to where your knee actually bends around. And so that's one of the reasons why um, people can tear stuff uh, in and around their knee so easily because those forces get to be extremely, extremely high when you're doing anything like pivoting quickly or um, rotating your knee um, a lot. Even just to lift your leg without anything else going on, your muscle pulls upward at this weird angle really close to the knee joint and just to hold up the weight of your leg, you have really, really high um, forces in those muscles and, and ligaments. So to kind of summarize this portion of the chapter, the three different types of levers, first class lever, second class lever, third class lever, from our simple machines problem, we can find examples of all of them in the human body. And the book goes into more detail on more examples that you can think about. So uh, you can read through this slide on your own, and, and I'll leave it up here so you can always pause the video. But that is the end of our Chapter 9 discussion. So I will see you in Chapter 10.